good morning, good evening, and maybe even good night, wherever you're listening to this. I'm Chris Dickerson, Disabled List Hall of Famer, accompanied by my longtime teammate, dear friend, Mr. Paul Yanish, a man as deep as the ocean. He loves all things country, Tex-Mex, and crossword. And this is Farm to the Show. And today, February 17th, 2023, it's about that time. The beginning of spring training, pitchers and catchers reported this week. Uh, as you've seen on all the social media, picks popping up, pitchers getting their bullpens in, and position players showing up shortly after. And Paul, one thing about February is I personally have a little biological clock that has me kind of ramped up, ready to go somewhere. But you know, we got nowhere to go. But it's definitely ingrained in our uh, our blood at this point that that February time you start planning to pick up, pack up get all your moving contraptions together and make that trip to uh, Florida or Arizona. Yeah, there's no doubt, man. I still got a little bit of the same with regards to this time of year, getting ready to go and, or at least feeling like we should. But now that we're uh, old and retired, it's uh, we just talk on the, on the podcast about it. So I know it's an exciting time for the, for the guys that are going, we got a bunch of guys that they work out here in Houston where I live that are, that are hitting the road, heading out and whatnot. And, it's um, pretty cool, pretty cool time for them as they're starting their journey, some of whom are, you know, going to minor league camp and some of whom are going to big league camp for the first time. And there's just a, a, a pretty big spectrum of what guys are expecting out of spring training. And it's, it's, a, it's a fun and exciting time for fans as well. Yeah, great time for fans. And, you know, clearly spring training being one of the more engaging opportunities that fans have all year. And when you get to go to some of these complexes, a lot of them are, you know, built around that, be able to get up close and personal with these guys. And but as a player, you know, those first couple of days, it's, you know, everybody has their own schedule. You know, I know Joey's still here. He's he's down in Hermosa and he'll probably take off on he's taken off on Saturday. And, you know, for the guys who don't have kind of a permanent uh, permanent residence there, it's, you know, it's kind of a grind. You're coming into a new place. Paul used to pack up the old the old Chevy and have uh, have that moving bar in the back with the hanger. I feel like everybody has like a has like a unique thing, whether you're shipping your shipping your car out, shipping clothes, clothes in and just basically living out of a suitcase for for six weeks in. You know, um, you know, assuming that, you know, it was probably later in my career that I'm just like, you know, I'm probably just going to go back to the the team hotel. Like you have a cleaner, you, you know, you're going to be living out of a suitcase anyways, but at least you have a cleaner. At least you have, you know, free coffee, free meals. Other guys are there that it just became so much easier rather than pursuing your own place. Um, but I particularly used to like when we used to have spring training uh, back in Sarasota and, and, and staying on Siesta Key for sure. Just uh those were those were those were good times, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I would love to be heading to spring training, but uh, you know, those first five days and getting out, and for you later in your career, having having two kids and having to do that whole deal, it definitely becomes a uh, it definitely cha changes the complexion of of that that departure and how you how you get settled in. Yeah, there's no doubt the uh, the en entire moving deal is is just becomes part. Of, it comes with the invite of professional baseball. There's there's no question, but. Spring training is cool for, for different reasons, like we mentioned, but, you know, I, I think we can both agree Arizona is a little bit more user friendly with regards to the actual playing aspect. You know, the, the farthest drive you're going to make is about an hour. And, you know, for at least for for myself, I know spring training was a time in which I had I played a lot. So I had to I had to play a lot every day. And it's different for guys to get a little farther down the road. Like we're talking about Joey, who who's going to go to spring training with obviously a different mindset, right? He's getting his at bats in and those type of established players are going to, are going to be in a little different program, which is, is all part of spring training. But to your point at the end of the day, it's, it's about, it's about the fans. And, and I know that this time of year is an exciting time hearing who's going to be the new guys in camp and who there is to be excited about down on the farm and those kind of things, new free agents and, and all kinds of stuff of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't miss Florida and especially you and I both know our first big league camps, you know, you get that big number on your back and, you know, you're going to be playing, uh, you playing clean up at the end, uh, you know, getting up maybe one or two a, a B's and late in the game. But when you have those trips where you're going down two hours, an hour and a half down to Fort Myers from Sarasota and then having to come back after on the bus, it's pretty rough. And it's just uh, Arizona. You're hopping in your car. You're driving, you know, 25 minutes, 20, 25, 30 minutes to, to Peoria or to, to Mesa. You're playing. You're in and out of the you know, you're in and out. And uh, you're back at your home complex at a, a pretty reasonable hour. So, 
you know, Arizona is, is just the, it's the way to go. Um, you know, with the new complexes showing up, uh, you know, every, every couple of years. And I, I really do like what they've been doing with these, the sharing of complexes, the salt river field and with the Rockies and the, the, um, the Rockies and the diamondbacks is great. And then when we moved in our new complex in 2010, was it, uh, in Goodyear with the, with the Indians, uh, was a nice little, nice little change, uh, coming from that, old uh, Sarasota complex. So with that, going into the 2023 season outlook, I personally, I got, I'm in the studio right now. We got 2012 highlights on with Chapman on the mound right now. And uh, it seems that this is a day game against Arizona. Not a whole lot of people in the stands. And I can imagine, unfortunately, that's kind of what it looked like this past season. Uh, The Reds coming off a miserable hundred loss uh, season, but Spring training, everybody's in first place. Everybody has high hopes. And with, uh, like you said, coming back with this farm system, uh, you know, the club has two of baseball's top 30 prospects in Ellie De La Cruz and Noel V. Marte, and uh, who can man the boat, the left side of the infield by the season's end. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, these first couple of weeks, we'll get to see these players uh, and, and, and how this works out. But one thing that they're, that they're doing in this second rebuild year is definitely is looking at, uh, you know, is looking at the system from within. I think the GM made it clear that this is something that they're looking to build, build with. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a matter of just being patient, but also, you know, we want to, you know, the team wants to see improvement and it's, it's rough going through a build, but to see what the, you know, that baseball, baseball America prospect list looks like in the annual report, that the Reds are in really good shape and should be an exciting spring training with these new prospects getting the opportunity to play and put their their skills on, on display this year. Yeah, the the GM, the, the organization as a whole, did a really good job, I think, via trade last last year, trying to, you know, first of all, acknowledging, you know, where they at a, where they're at as an organization, and then understanding, look, with with the the type of market that Cincinnati's in and the way that they're going to have to operate, they're going to have to build from within. And, you know, you, you and I are good examples. We, we benefited from that back when we were coming up through the organization. And I don't think it's going to be any different, but to your point, they, they kind of reloaded the the farm system in a, in a way that's given them some hope looking into the future and hopefully the not so distant future. I, I think a couple of those guys are going to have the opportunity to, to make an impact on the big league club, hopefully this year. And, you know, that's always a, a, an interesting dynamic, the way you handle those types of prospects that are very highly touted and trying to make sure that, you know, they're, they're ready for the big league, so to speak. And, you know, the combining the, they need to get in there and get their feet wet and understand what it's like to be a big leaguer versus are they really ready? And you don't want to give them too much too quick. And, you know, those are, those are the type of decisions that the player development staff is going to have to make. And that being said, I think everybody's excited about some of that young talent. Yeah, absolutely. And to give everybody context, I was drafted out of the university of Nevada in 2003 and Paul out of rice universities and in Oh four. And so Paul and I have spent a lot of time. We came up through the system and along that, along those lines, you know, we've, we've, we had our, our, you know, we're fortunate enough to, to see a lot of the prospects that did get to the big leagues. And I think that's what we were, we were so lucky. And I think that's when I, when I got, when I got traded off, I think that was one of the roughest things is, is that particular team, uh, we are so ingrained, um, you know, within that system coming up for the last seven, eight years. Uh, you, me, Drew, Paul, or you, me, Drew, Stubbs, uh, Jay Bruce. Joey was a 2002 uh, draft pick, and we played our, our first year was with Joey in, in Billings, Montana. Ryan Hannigan, all these guys, uh, you know, for, for five, six years uh, coming up through the system and getting to the big leagues. Uh, it's pretty special. And so looking at what this uh, this group that's coming has the opportunity to do is is very exciting is to to you know is as they go through double a and triple a and they know that they're on the cusp is to have that that chemistry uh coming into the big leagues and this will this will give them uh this will give them some good experience just uh like you said it's just is being a professional what to expect and then you know they can just uh show up and just not worry so much about uh that part of it but come in and just do what they do best and that's and that's play baseball and that's going to be the biggest the biggest psychological thing for them is you know, just go out and play, you know, they're there to impress, but, you know, let the playing do, let the playing do, do it on the field to speak for itself. And, and, you know, it's not the time to put too much pressure on yourself to make an impression. Um, but you know, spring, it's spring training. You're looking to just get better every day. Um, uh, general manager, Nick crawl said, uh, there, there's going to be a core 
of what we're doing. We have a solid groups of, group of kids coming up, um, you know, from 2020. We've got a solid group of guys on the big league club and our minor league system. I'm excited for our young starters. Alexis Diaz did really well. Our bullpen was solid in the second half. Jonathan India being really healthy coming into spring with Tyler Stevenson. We've had a lot of solid players at the big league level. It's just continued to develop, to develop out our system. So we'll see what happens and we won't, Paul and I won't, uh, won't, won't beat a dead horse. I'm sure everybody's sick and tired of hearing how bad the season was, but bringing in Will Myers, I think that's a really interesting, uh, free agent signing actually, because I think personally will will do really well in that ballpark. Um, he's got, he's got ridiculous pop to all fields, which plays in that, you know, great American plays to his strength and be able to hit balls out all, all over the place. So I think that'll be easy. It'll give Joey some, some, uh, some time off at first base. They can rotate with DH. And I think it kind of changes, it changes, changes. Um, it's got a different dynamic where you have two guys that were, uh, you know, there were perennial all-stars at one point. Um, be able to do that that rotation and, and keep those bats in line, but also just keep you know keep Joey fresh, uh, you know with with his, with his legs and you know at the I wouldn't say the tail end of his career, but <laughs> where's Joey now? Thirty seven, you know thirty seven. Yeah, that's definitely the tail end. I like um, I like, this, I like to say he's old enough. He's, he's old yeah, enough. old enough, old enough. Exactly. So. So moving on from spring training, like I said, we're not gonna we're not gonna dwell on the past. We're gonna look to build to the future, but we're also gonna revisit some exciting news. Um, one of our former teammates, Mister Scott Rowland, I have down here in my notes, keeping it rolling, literally. Um, the Hall of Fame induction of Scott Rowland was it validated? That's gonna be our topic today. Uh, Scott played 17 seasons uh, for the Phillies, Cardinals, Blue Jays, and the Reds from his career until like 1996 to 2012 he was a seven-time all-star 1997 nationally rookie of the year and won the 2006 world series as a member of the cardinals regarded as one of the best defensive men defensive third baseman of all time with eight glove gold gloves to go along with his career 2077 hits 1211 runs and finished with a career war of 70.1 which ranks 10th all time among third basemen pretty impressive pretty impressive and you know being uh you know just growing up seeing him with the phillies and then those those monsters of, of teams that they had in, in st louis i was always a huge fan and when uh our uh our, our first two years in 08 and 09 i think we made those trips up to toronto when he was there and just to see him i think that was the first time we actually got to play against him and not only he's just just he's a large guy in stature but uh he is as pro as it gets and uh, I couldn't be couldn't be happier to see Scotty go in. But your experience with them, you know, sharing an infield with them, and I'm sure you have some stories. And or you know, me being on the outside, you know, I'm outfield. You know, we both have stories. But your your take on on you know yet a, another Hall of Famer that you got to play with, and you know, in those years that you got to spend with them in in Cincinnati. Yeah, I think it just Scott's career obviously was it speaks for itself with regards to some of the things he was able to accomplish. But, you know, I think one of the really telling things about him is what what other people within the game say about him. And when I say within the game, I'm talking about, you know, other players, obviously, but also the the people who the decision makers and some of the organizations that he's been in. Obviously, Walt Jockety, you know, traded for him a couple of different times and. He just he just made such a significant impact. I know for me personally, as a young player, I had I had appreciated Scott from afar prior to ha having the opportunity to meet him and play with him in Cincinnati. And, you know, the the one thing that really, really sticks out and like even still resonates with me to this day is just just the way that he went about his business from a routine standpoint. You know, it's let's not let's not kid ourselves. There was some prerequisite ability that, that he had. Like you mentioned, he's a he's a very large human, strong guy. And, you know, over the course of time he just on a day-to-day -day basis like the the ability to win eight gold gloves goes much farther than just just physical ability and his 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 mental toughness and then also just the what the the term that i would use is probably grit right and because I, I he he actually told me you know one of the things that he kind of impressed upon me from a defensive standpoint is you can be you can be good on accident but you can't i mean you can be good on accident, but you can't be great on accident. And that's one of the things from a day-to-day -day standpoint, just doing the same thing, the same routine over and over again to get really good at it was, I think, what carried him through his career. And 
and, and that being said, not that that's just talking about the defensive side, which me selfishly, I appreciated. Right. But, but the offensive side, you know, he was hitting cleanup for most of his career on some really good teams. One of which, like you mentioned, won the world series. So I just think that it's, it's, it's an impressive guy that went about his business in like a super appropriate way. And in this day and age, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot more impression on, on, you know, being very showy and drawing a lot of attention to yourself. And that's just not who Scott was. And I think, I think the people that know him best, you know, at the time in which he played really appreciated that appreciated that about him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one thing. If you watch old highlights of Scott playing on that Astro turf back in back in Philly, that's exactly what it took to to is just pure grit. Um, anytime, you know, the the amount of work that you're putting in on, on just on your on your body alone. I think that's you know, it's unfortunate. It's kind of crazy because you know as well as I do, you know, when we got into the system, you see all these old coaches that we've seen on TV, you know, played in the 80s and 90s and that AstroTurf and how that affected, you know, their their back. They all have had, you know, they've had hip replacements, knee replacements. It's that that stuff back in the day was no joke. So to watch Scott with those highlights went back in Philly at uh, old veteran stadium. Um, yeah, it was, uh, was, you gotta be gritty for sure to play on there. And it was only later that we understood, you know, the first year he was over with us, I think he missed uh, a, a pretty significant amount of games, uh, because of his back. Um, but again, you know, it, it, but just the versatility, uh, stands out to me, just not only just gritty, be able to hit 30 home runs a year, but it was also a different, different, different game back then. Scotty was playing with teams that, you know, in St. Louis, where, as you know, they, they'll they'll small ball you to death i mean they just play play ba they play baseball the right way you know you'd have guys come on they bunt they hit and run and scotty despite hitting you know three or four in some of these lineups like he'll they'll throw a hit and run on you with no problem and they'll just they'll run you ragged and i think that's what i respected most about the cardinals back in the day is that they just played great baseball and having the buy-in from guys like scott who could use all fields and sacrifice himself with hit and runs and stuff like that was was awesome and you know, coming over, just I always love that, uh, you know, these guys that that do go in that we can say that they were great teammates. And I'm I, I honestly feel that that Scott was one of those guys that I, I truly enjoyed having who had so much to give uh, to the game and especially to younger players. And um, but he just had just this unique, very unique, uh, you know, very it was very stoic, but also very dry sarcasm uh, that uh, was, was was truly unique. On uh, July 15th, 2011, he became the fourth third baseman ever, ever in the history of baseball, ever to have 2,000 hits, 500 doubles, 300 home runs, and 1,200 RBIs. What? Along with these guys name, I'm not sure if you heard of him, Paul, but there's guy Mike Schmidt, George Brett, and, Tri and Chipper Jones. You know, no big deal. Three Hall of Famers. But, uh, you know, if we're trying to validate this conversation, it's like you look at the you look at the war, the 10th all time among third basemen, which is it's just any time you get into top 10 of anything in the, a game that's 150 years old, like you're, you're doing something right. And, uh, you know, with these three names are just absolute icons in the game. You know, I 100 percent feel like it's it's deserving, you know, and then thrown on the defensive part. He was truly one of the most extraordinary uh, defensive players defensive players of all time anytime you're getting up close to double digits in gold in gold gloves it's 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 pretty pretty incredible yeah there, there's no question those guys you're talking about are, are, are borderline cartoon characters right so for scott to 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 accomplish those those things that being that being that group to me it's it's very evident and you know i i, I have no problem admitting that i'm a little biased you know i can preface it with that having played with scott and having an appreciation for the way he went about his business, but, but the numbers are what they are and the length of his career, you know, despite what you mentioned with regards to, to playing on the turf and, you know, certain times having some health issues with the back and whatnot, you know, I, I, I don't think it's really that close. I, I think that again, to go back to, to reiterate, if you listen to what other players would say, I, I don't think you'd get a whole lot of argument on the fact that Scott Rowland's a hall of famer. Yeah, absolutely. As he, as he hits a home run right behind me, I got the 2012 Reds highlights playing on the screen behind me and Scotty Rowland just went big fly. And that is a, that's a sprint right there. I think that, you know, that kind of tells you all everything you need to know about, about Scotty right there. No showboating, do your job, get around the bases and that's it. So with that being said, hall of famer, HOF, uh, you know, going down on his signature forever, your hall of fame lineup, Mr. Yadish. Who else? So Scott, 
and I'm sure you've got a couple others that you've played with. Yeah, so for me, it's uh, I mean, King Griffey Jr. Obviously in Cincinnati, we we both were had the opportunity to be around, um, and then I played in Atlanta for a couple of years with. It was the last year for Chipper Jones, which was pretty cool to see because he had already announced that he was going to retire. So as we're going around the league that year, um, you know, he's receiving gifts from other organizations as you know throughout the year, and it was pretty cool to see again a guy that. It, having played for a team like the Braves that, you know, were, were so national, they got, they got fans all over the country. It, it was a really cool experience to, to get to play next to Chipper and, and see some of the things that some of the impacts that he made on the game of baseball around the country, having, you know, having the type of career that he did. Yeah. And just being around those guys, what did you, you know, I'll, uh, I'll just, I'll rattle off my list, but you know, besides the two that you said in, in Cincinnati, um, and then when I went to New York in 2011, 2012, getting to play with, uh, with Jeet and Mariano, um, you know, it's just, it's just a, it's a different level of, of just consistency that got them in the first place, but being able to witness what they do on a daily basis is also, you know, kind of the, the second part of the story. And that's not what people see a lot behind closed doors. They don't get to see the, the preparation, um, you know, get to see the early work, uh, the, 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 the yeah, bats, the, the cage, the cage work and just how they continue to, you know, take care of their body. And they're just, you know, they show up early, they're putting the right things in their body. They're, you know, getting their drills or getting their work done. And a lot of the stuff we spend so much time at the field, uh, every day. And I think a large part of that, you get to, you know, the, we get to be seen for three and a half hours. And not all all the work and preparation that goes on behind the scenes, but you know, to to come out for these guys to constantly be out doing their early work, to doing their extra infield drills, their their ground balls, and to be in the cage and have the same routine every day. And I think that's one of the biggest things that sticks out is routine. That's the key word. And it's it's interesting, especially if there's young, you know, there's young athletes listening to this podcast. And there's a there that's a big word when it comes to um, just development. And especially when you get into scouting, a lot of these guys want to know if you have a routine when you get into, you know, when you get drafted, they want to know what your routine is. And you look at all these guys that we just mentioned, junior Scotty Rowland, Mariano, th their routines were, you know, they're ironclad, same thing every day. I mean, even at to, uh, you know, and talk about, well, the, the Jeets peanut butter and jelly sandwich might be a little bit of, uh, wouldn't be so much routine as it is, uh, um, what is it Superst called superstition superstition, superstition. Yeah. we'll we'll leave a little little bit of a gray line there but showing up to the field doing the, doing things right i think that's what you know separates some of the you know that's what separates hall of famers not just the, the god-given talent but able, able to put that to work on a on a daily basis and like you said with that tour you know i w got to witness the the ultimate tour the merit the mariano uh, farewell tour. And that was particularly interesting to see just all the different gifts that he got, you know, for every stop. And I, I remember the, I think it was the Minnesota twins where he gave him the, the lounge chair made of the broken bats from over the, <laughs> over the last 10, 15 years. And, uh, you know, going to Cleveland and getting the pinstripe guitar, but you know, those two guys, like you said, literal cartoon characters, um, you know, guy did it on, on one pitch and Jeet, is are you know arguably is one of the greatest winners in sports history um so you know very fortunate to have to have my time in new york with those guys and just uh you know hopefully just you know everybody enjoying those time because when those guys are guys are done it's like uh you know there's not going to be any anybody else like those guys and so to be able to see to to have a hall of famer playing your city is truly spe truly special and i think there hasn't been uh, there hasn't been one since, so I think that would be so he would technically be the most recent Hall of Famer that that donned a Reds uniform. Um, is that would that be correct? I, I think that's right, but it uh, l l let's not lose sight of the fact the Reds have a pretty storied past and a bunch of Hall of Famers in uh, in the fold. But um, yeah, I think Scott might be the most recent. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so two Scott, so we're staying on Scott here. Like I said, you got to you got to spend a little bit more time around him, being in the infield. What are your some of your favorite Scott Rowland stories and classic quotes? Yeah, it's tough. So some of these stories you can't talk about on air, right? But um, he the, one of the things that sticks out, kind of to elaborate on Scott's sense of humor and subtlety of it, 
um, you know, we're, we're in spring training one year and I think it was, you know, the previous year, Joey had won the MVP and Dusty's up in front of the, in front of the, the whole, you know, every, the whole locker room of spring training, which at that point in time is at the beginnings, 55, 60 guys. Right. And so Dusty's talking about gold gloves and talking about how Scott's got gold and Dusty was real big on defense. And, you know, he says, Scott, how many, how many, uh, how many gold gloves you got? And Scott says, man, Dusty, I can't remember. And, you know, Dusty proceeds on with the conversation and starts, you know, he's kind of talking, talking to the, to the, to the team and the organization as a whole. And then, you know, it's, it's two minutes later, Scott hops up and, you know, makes kind of a big deal and says, you know what, Dusty, it was seven, it was seven gold gloves that I, at the time he, he hadn't won the eighth yet. So it was seven gold gloves. And, you know, it's it, the, the, the locker room kind of, you know, erupts with laughter, so to speak. And it's just one of those deals where it's real, real subtle, but at the same time, it's, it's one of those intangibles that Scott brought to the table. His, the presentation, as I call it, was, was second to none. It was, um, <laughs> It was it was pretty special. So there's there's plenty of stories like like that we could go through. I'm, I'm sure you got one too to, to share. But for me, that's one that sticks out. Yeah, a plus a plus delivery, and I I do remember that because I think uh, I was I was two lockers down from him, and I'm not sure the I'm I'm gonna have to fact check you on the on the year because Joey won the MVP in I believe 2010. 2011 because that was our first year in the new complex in Goodyear actually so that was 2000 I believe that was 2010 yeah so that was 2010 that was our first year in that complex and Dusty giving that speech and going around the room talking about who's got who's got gold and Dusty I believe was a two-time winner again I'm gonna have to fact check myself after after the fact but he said you know I got two I you know change positions to left field and uh you know just talking about just the work you have to put in to just be a, a solid defensive team and Brandon had just won the won a gold glove that year um and it was I think he was talking about Joey because Joey had said publicly that he he would like to win a gold glove at some point <laughs> and so he's just you know he's just going around kind of taking names and you know you know he's just going there and taking names just talking about the emphasis on defense and um you know just basically really the 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 way to adapt because I think I was personally uh, you know I was you know indirectly involved in that conversation because I was going to be asked to be playing left field a lot more that that year and the fact that Dusty had changed positions and won gold his first year in an, in a new position um <clears throat> but yeah that that was that was an all-time classic moment and then I'll remember the look on Scott's face when we had a rain delay we were in town we were in Cincinnati and uh, we had a rain delay I was with the Yankees and you know that's you know that's a season that you want to win and there's you know it's, I I I wouldn't put past Dusty that he was he was given this uh, this a, a pretty stark uh, you know motivational pretty exceptional motivational speech uh, in between innings we had a three game series in Cincinnati and of course who who doesn't want to beat the Yankees when they come come to town and uh, you know there was some some speech about Dusty and Dusty broke out some some knives talking about you know, his, uh, you know, his, his childhood. And you know, it was just, it was kind of, it was very dusty off the wall, but whatever it was, I remember the look on Scott's face and he was uh particular entertained. He looked like a little kid in a candy store that just came out. He was like, I don't know what that was all about, but you know, whatever dusty, I, I don't know how, how it got to me, but it, it got to me. And, and Scott was particularly fired up for this story, but you know, to go, you know, from somebody who's who's been around the block so many times, and to see that connection, just uh, how those two ad adapt uh, to each other, Dusty being able to be such a players a players coach, and Scott having you know the ability to to have have that presence that 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 joking presence in in the clubhouse was was something that that. Uh, you know, I'll always remember. And, you know, we could sit here and, you know, bring up uh, more, more stories and, and classic quotes. Uh, but we're going to, we're going to move on. I think we've, uh, we've covered it all today. We're going to be looking, we'll be back next week and we'll be looking at position players that are coming into camp. But right now we're just going to wrap up, say farewell to you all. Paul and I are looking forward to continuing this, our maiden voyage today. Paul, congratulations. Episode number one in the books. And uh, we're ex I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get this started. You know, as coming from, you know, spending almost 10 years in the system to be uh, to back on, you know, to doing this, uh, this new venture uh, with you, I'm, I'm pretty fired up. You know, Cincinnati has a special place in my heart uh, for sure. Everything but the skyline, Chile. I just 
you know, first <laughs> I, I can't get past the fistful of cheese, but you know, it's an acquired taste and I'm sure there's people on here who swear by it, but, um, yeah. Well, you can, you can, uh, jump off that bridge if you want. I'm, uh, Skyline was fine with me, but it, uh, I am excited to do the podcast. I'm, I'm excited to be back in, in, uh, involved with, with, with Cincinnati Reds because of, for the same reason, I got a soft spot in my heart. It's where we got called up for the first time, which is something you never forget. We still got a lot of friends in the organization, even on the coaching staff right now. So, um, I'm excited about, you know, hopefully them turning the, turning the, the organization around a little bit, like we talked about via trade and getting going in the right direction this year. And, Excited about following them while they do it. Yeah, absolutely. So week two, we'll be back uh, as, you know, free agency continues to close up. There was a couple moves made yesterday. Uh, Alex Reyes going to the Dodgers. So we're not quite done. I know there's a, there's a couple names still out there. We're going to be talking about building a team the right way. The fallacy of spending money and winning. Uh, career choices, uh, family impact, and the mental sides of trades as we're going to be looking to, you know, that's coming out of spring training. I think there's still a lot of that. We've got six weeks left, and there's still some some deals to be made for sure. And also, we're going to lighten it up. we got our top five baseball movies of all time next week. Paul, it was a pleasure, and let's do it again next week, buddy. All right, Chris. Talk to you soon, bud.